Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and joining me now is uh, Joe Biggs. I'm going to keep Joe here for one more segment, and then we're going to be joined by Lionel. And I've got some questions to ask Lionel. I want to get his opinion about what's happening uh, with politics. But I think there's also, uh, we, we've got an article up on Infowars.com. And this is the question, Joe, that I would ask any of these candidates if I was allowed to ask one of them. I would say, can the government, can the federal government ban anything, anything? I mean, we had a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol. We got another one. We had the 18th, what was it, 18th and 21st, I think, to ban it and then to make it legal again. We had 100 years ago a Congress that recognized that they did not have the authority. The federal government was not delegated the authority. And the Ninth and Tenth Amendments make it very clear that unless they're expressly given the authority, they don't have it. That's still retained by the people, by the states. The states could create alcohol prohibition if they wanted to. Or they could, like we've seen with uh, Colorado and with Washington State, they could say we're going to decriminalize marijuana. And uh, But we've got a, a, a Republican candidate, Chris Christie, who says that if he's elected president, uh, he's going to shut that down. So the question I would ask these guys is, where's your authority to ban anything, including things like cancer drug treatments or supplements like many of them have tried to ban? I, I just don't get why people would jump on this whole ban marijuana bag and, or a wagon. Because you have to understand how many people out there who smoke pot <laughs> who normally aren't going to go out and vote. As mm -hmm. soon as you do that, I mean, it seemed like that would be a... a a smart move to make to go ahead and be all in for it, legalize it. You're going to get a lot of people's votes. Yeah, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, guess what? It's not a bad thing. It helps people out. Yeah, I don't think it really helped Chris Christie do that because, as I pointed out before, when he went to the uh, New Jersey racetrack on Sunday, he was routinely booed. Of course, he's not very popular now in New Jersey. I don't think he'd get reelected as uh, governor, so maybe he'll fail up. But I don't think so. I think he's in that uh, junior varsity team now as far as the debate goes. I don't know. He might have made the uh, top 10, but I, I, I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and look at that again. Oh, he did make the top 10. Okay. So he's in the top 10. But, of course, this is something that, again, is really simply a horse race. Like the story I mentioned yesterday, just two months ago, if we look at the totals that people had, we had Bush, Carson, Huckabee, Rubio, Walker, all tied at 10%, according to a Quinnipiac poll that was just two months ago. And then there was Rand Paul at 7%, but of course, he didn't show up. They excised that. They took him out, and they showed people who got less than Rand Paul, which would be Cruz at 5%, Trump at 5%, Christie at 4 Fiorina at 2 Kasich at 2 but Rand Paul at 7 he didn't show up. And then we have now over the last couple of months, uh, because of the inflammatory rhetoric that... Uh, uh, Donald Trump has said, also because he speaks truth to power. That's very attractive to people, but he's also said it in a very inflammatory way. Uh, he's gotten a lot of coverage. He's gotten, as Rand Paul points out, probably about a billion dollars worth of coverage. If you look at the number of minutes that they have uh, given to uh, people, uh, he's gotten virtually all of the coverage. Trump's going to lead it the whole way, and then when it comes time, Bush is going to be the guy that comes in. Yeah, it's interesting. And, but that, that should open people's eyes, though, to show you that the American people are obviously voting out there and, you know, going out doing these uh, polls, and people like Trump, they like what he says, but the establishment doesn't want that. They want someone that they can buy out. They've already bought out that entire family. Yes. And they want to get him in. Yes, very true. And it's interesting also, you know, to look at, at Donald Trump. I mean, he was originally, you know, when we talk about him, is, is he a dark horse candidate? Is he a stalking horse? Is he there as cover for somebody like a Jeb Bush or even Hillary Clinton? Because before he started uh, giving money to Republicans, he was giving a lot of money to the Clinton family. He also gave money to Ted Cruz. About a year ago, he was saying that he didn't think uh, that Ted Cruz was qualified to run for president because of natural born citizen requirements. Uh, then he changed his tune. He started giving money to Ted Cruz before he himself uh, started running for presidency. And of course, the two of them have met privately. Uh, they have a very similar uh, stance in terms of saying things that are going to be offensive to the Washington power structure. That's a lot of uh, the popularity of both of them. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Joe Biggs, stay with us right after the break. We're going to be talking to Lionel. We'll be right back. Joining us in this segment is Lionel, and we're going to get to Lionel in just a moment. Before we do, I want to let you know about the sales that we have at InfoWarsLife.com. We have a 24-hour flash sale on DNA Force. 30% off for the next 24 hours. We also have a buy two silver bullet, get two free. Uh, that's through this week, and we have free shipping through this week on everything at the store. Things like nascent iodine, survival shield X2. Anything that you get at the InfoWars Life store is free shipping this week. We extended it one more week as a thank you to those who support our operation here. That's InfoWarsLife.com. 
Now, going back to uh, Lionel. Lionel is an Emmy Award-winning television news decoder. And so we're going to talk to him and have him decode some of the news, especially about Donald Trump. Interesting comments uh, he's had about Donald Trump, as well as a legal analyst. So we're going to ask him uh, some questions about the family as well. He's a licensed trial lawyer and a former prosecutor as well. LionelMedia.com, and you can find him on Twitter at Lionel Media. At Lionel Media, that's his Twitter handle. Uh, thanks for joining us, Lionel. Thank you, sir. Thank I've, you. I've got a couple of uh, articles. Let's start out with what's happening to our children. What's happening with this out of control uh, state? Here's a couple of headlines I'll just throw at you. One of them, uh, both of these I was going to talk about yesterday, but I didn't have time. A couple of articles that were up on Infowars.com. One of them, a video shows a cop handcuffing elementary school aged disabled child. Bullying this disabled child who is in a wheelchair, handcuffing this kid. Another one from the UN says, uh, jail parents who spank their children. It looks like they want to be our mommies and daddies. They're spanking us using the the police. And essentially, our schools have turned into training camps for living in a prison society, haven't they, Lionel? Well, you know, the prison industrial complex is now merging into the farm team for indoctrination mm -hmm. and um, retraining. Couple of things. First, I absolutely, positively am against the notion of spanking. Hitting anybody for any reason to train, to discipline at all. Now, that being said, parents and especially teachers, but when a parent exercises a parental control, and believes in good faith that this is in the best interest of the child, and there's no welts or trauma, mm -hmm. the police should not be involved in that. Here's what's going on. I want you to imagine, and many of the people listening and watching today, who have a child who has special needs, emotionally handicapped, emotionally disturbed, behavioral, and I don't even want to use these terms because I'm not sure what terms people find objectionable, but I think you know what we're talking about. Now, David, I have been a prosecutor. I've been a lawyer most of my adult life. I have seen grown men, tough, cry like a baby when they're put in the back of a patrol car, when they feel the wrist bracelets of being handcuffed and the fear, the lights, the sound, it's a, it's a sensory overload. The, 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 the whole spectrum of this. These are grown men. Now imagine David, you're a child who doesn't necessarily understand things the way we wish that child would. And through the prism of a child sees this horror and wonders I'm not in trouble. This isn't a note to my parent. I'm being arrested. I'm in the back of a patrol car. I'm being frog marched out of my class, subject to the humiliation, the shame, the ignominy, the finger pointing. I'm put into the back of a patrol car. I'm going to come back to school and hear the, the chiding and the remarks. Hey, jailbird. Four, this is the best part, on my column today, on my piece today at LionelMedia.com, I, I, I reprinted an article, David, showing 19 examples of why kids are being arrested. Burping and belching in class. <laughs> failing to pick, oh, I'm serious, yeah. failing to pick up crumbs. Writing on a desk, scribbling, I love Abby. And being arrested for showing love. Now I can go on and on. Now, if you think that this is somehow getting tough, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. If you think that and you don't see what's happening in the militarization of the police now bleeding over into the classroom. Yeah, that's the thing that's really concerning because you and I went to school. We didn't have we didn't have police in the schools. We had <laughs> we had spanking in the schools, quite frankly. And one of the reasons I brought that up was because I thought it was such an amazing a, a counterpoint to each other. At the same right. time, the UN 
right. which is not involved in America, shouldn't be involved in America, wants to dictate to parents right. how to do discipline. We turn the police state loose on our children in our right. schools to not only do things that are far worse than the spankings that we used to have from the principals. They are right. tasering children. We have yep. a kid down here in Bastrop that got tasered. He wasn't doing anything. You can see the video footage. The cop walks up to him. It was a fight. He wasn't even involved in the fight. He was, if anything, he was trying to stop the people. Nothing was going on. Hits him with a taser. The kid falls down, hits his head on a concrete floor, and now he's brain damaged for the rest of his life. What's going on when they come after parents and saying, we're going to take your kids away if you spank kids, we're going to throw you in jail, and yet they, they send out these types of people to victimize even disabled, mentally handicapped kids in wheelchairs? Now, remember, now, David, it's funny, you and I, uh, for people who don't know this, you and I share a very interesting parallel. Our development, I mean, where, I don't know if you want Oh, yeah. Yeah. We both went to we both grew up in Tampa. <laughs> we went to the same university. Exactly. Very close to the same time. Yeah, we probably are. I mean, it, it's just amazing. I was thunderstruck. But I am a a, 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 a loyal alumnus of the Catholic school system. I never saw a kid get hit once mm -hmm. when that nun walked in all four feet tall, wearing full penguin regalia <laughs> in the hot. Tampa, Hillsborough County, sun, and not breaking a sweat in black and cardboard. You, I never heard of a policeman. Now, years later, David, you might recall, there was something called the school resource officer or the SRO. This was the officer who kind of would be, hey, David, how are you, officer friendly? How are you, Dick? Come on, move along, boys. And it was a slow introduction of a guy who was, just kind of there, kind of a, a well-armed security guard, not really an assistant to the point, but there was a police. Now, what happens is, instead of a police, of, of a teacher, and by the way, we, we, we have two concomitant roles of blame here, two vectors of liability. The police, who could exercise discretion and say, I'm not going to arrest a kid. I'm No, I'm not going to do this. And the, the teacher, but, but David, they would, they're, they're now calling 911. Now, what's interesting to note is, and you brought this up about the UN, to show you how schizophrenic it is. You know, this is learned helplessness. This is classic learned helplessness where you are so beaten down, you can't predict what to do anymore. Oh, the yeah. classic story of the dog who was, a, who was given electric shock so many times that when you open up the pen, it just sits there. It says, I can't even move anymore. But the <laughs> UN is telling you either you're being too strict and you shouldn't spank your kids and we're going to come after you or it's okay to be excessive and go after a child. And I don't know how this thing works. So what we're seeing here is the systematic habituation and the conditioning of adults and parents to this thing called authority. Yeah. This absolute heartless, mindless, learned helplessness. You know, David, I want you to go through the, these lists of people and or these these conditions of, of what kids have been um, basically arrested for. Let me also say this. Let's assume your child uh, has a scrape with the law, so to speak. And let's say your child decides to try to get a job. But your child can't. Your child can't because your child's got a record, got an arrest record. His permanent okay. record. Going all the way back to kindergarten. That's where they're going to start this, right? Right. So now you're, now you're, so, so you have, you have this, this over uh, enforcement of this. And again, I want to say, you know, David, we, we, we have kids who are being, who are drowning in, in psych meds, who are over medicated, who have very serious emotional and behavioral problems. I was a juvenile prosecutor. That's not a description of my mental wherewithal, but I <laughs> saw these kids, and more often than not, it was my first my my first look at how the criminal justice system handles mental health. But you're going to turn a kid over, and that kid's going to say, using Pavlovian conditioning, every time I see a cop. Every time somebody tells me no, I'm going to remember that. I'm going to remember how they made me feel. I'm going to remember how they laughed. I'm going to remember how afraid I was. 
I remember how nobody was there to protect me. Mm-hmm. I was the ultimate victim of violation. I trusted my teacher and I don't anymore. I trusted the police and I don't anymore. I don't trust authority. Nobody's here to help me. I can't depend on anyone. And I'm going to give this back. Somebody's going to pay for this. I mean, if you can't see where this is going. It's amazing how this has changed over the number of years. I mean, I remember, as we point out, they didn't have police in the schools when you and I were young. Even when my, my wife was teaching school, they still had the system where they would take somebody away. They would punish them in secret. And we'll talk about that when we come back. What is behind this training camp for the prison industrial state? Stay with us. We'll be right back with Lionel. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and I'm talking to Lionel, an Emmy Award-winning television news decoder. As he puts it, he's an analyst. He's a commentator. Of course, he is also a licensed trial lawyer, former prosecutor. I want to talk to him about an article that's on the New York Times as well. Should prison sentences be based on crimes that haven't been committed yet? We'll get to that topic. But before we do, we've been talking about how schools have changed, how they've become training programs for the police, uh, the, the prison industrial state uh, police at all the schools, the over-the-top uh, treatment of our children. At the same time, the UN is saying that it wants to see parents jailed who spank their children. So we're going to go to the extreme against parents, but we're going to allow the most extreme treatment by uniformed personnel that we can imagine in the schools. Do you feel that? That's what uh, Lionel just calls schizophrenic. I call it cognitively dissonant. And I tell you, I think when I see that kind of radical juxtaposition of these things, I think there's an agenda going on here. What about you, Lionel? <laughs> well, I, 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 I couldn't agree more. First of all, uh, I apologize for saying schizophrenic with all due respect and apologies to schizophrenics out there trying to <laughs> blaspheme. You're not, you know, David, there is a something where I want you to, to go back and let, let's do a thought experiment. You and I are part of the ruling class. We're at the top of the pyramid. And our division is social. I've always said that I've told Alex that I want to be one day the psychologist general, not the (laughs) surgeon general, not the attorney general, but the psychologist. I want to construct means and attitudes and persuasions. But what you and I would do, David, is we'd sit down and we'd say, first of all, our assignment is part of this, call it whatever you want, new world order or unipolar world or ruling class is what I call it. We're going to destroy family and people. And we're going to make them pliant and compliant. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to destroy parental autonomy. How do we do that? First of all, we tell parents that they can't spank. That they, and, and, and I'm not endorsing spanking, but it doesn't really matter. That's not the issue. We're going to tell parents you can't do that. We're going to tell parents they cannot have any say in vaccine mm-hmm. or the type of diet. Or the type of games that your child plays. Maybe dodgeball this week we might consider to be a problem. We're also one day going to go after food. You're going to have them. I'm vegan by choice, but you're going to see them going after parents who elect to uh, have their kids uh, raised vegan. Not because they care about the diet of a child. They just want to exert more control. Mm -hmm. Then it's going to be circumcision. Watch when that happens. Uh, Irrespective of religious anything. Because you see, in our thought experiment, David, it doesn't matter why we're doing this. We want to exact control. And we also want you as a parent to feel that, you know, they, and and, and I love this, it takes a village. Yes. I love the idea that, yes, we in society share a responsibility to assist, to help when need be. But we do not enjoy our child being part of the collective as somebody said one time it takes a village idiot to believe that so or as see, melissa harry harris perry said uh, we've got to get over this notion that uh, there's private ownership of children you know when i heard that one of the things when i hear that lionel and, and we, we play that clip all the time as a parent i don't think that i own my children i never thought of it that way it takes no. somebody who's running a village to think about ownership of children i just love my children it's not about that. And that's one of the reasons why I, I didn't like to see uh, uh, corporal punishment in the schools. I'm, my wife was a teacher in uh, elementary school. One time she had to escort a child because uh, he had been just impossible to handle. She scored some of the principal's office. The principal 
spanked the child in front of her. The kid wasn't crying. My wife was hysterical, a basket case. She said, I will never do that again. And, and really, it's about having someone disciplining your child who loves them, doesn't see them as owning them. And that's right. another aspect of all this, how the government thinks they own us, how they should track us and control us and categorize us in their permanent record as if we were their inventory, their cattle. And also, you know, I, I, as you know, People are going to say, well, there you go again, Mr. Conspiracy. Mr. Tinfoil Hat, always scared <laughs> about the government coming after you. Always worried. Who are these people that want your children? Who are? And what, what I remember, going back to our thought experiment, in addition to us having this particular thought vector where we tell people that they have no say, we also bring in people and we applaud them, like, for example, John Stewart, who was one of the most important parts of this, this collective, who laughed at people who dared to question Jade Helm, or laughed at people who dared to question. So remember, we're, I hear the music. And, and, yeah, and he was also making uh, secret visits to the White House, cooperating with Obama on how to sell Obama's agenda. Let's not forget that as well. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Lionel, Lionel Media. He's a licensed trial lawyer. We're, we're going to talk to him about prison the sentences based on crimes run. that haven't been committed yet. Stay Alex with us. We'll be right back. The- I'm talking to Lionel, Emmy Award-winning news decoder, as he puts it. He's a, an analyst, a commentator, and also a former trial lawyer and prosecutor. I want to talk to him about this article that was on the New York Times yesterday. Should prison sentences be based on crimes that haven't been committed yet? Haven't been committed yet. Pre-crime, minority report. We're going to talk about that real quickly before we get back to Lionel. We have a uh, sale up, a 24-hour sale, a flash sale of DNA Force, 30% off DNA Force for the next 24 hours. It's our most hardcore product from InfoWars Life yet, loaded with BioPQQ compound backed by 120, 175 clinical studies. It contains more potent antioxidant activity than vitamin C. And again, you can get that right now for 30% off for the next 24 hours, a big sale at InfoWarsLife.com. Free shipping through this week for everything at InfoWarsLife.com. Things like Survival Shield X2, which is also in stock. Read the reviews. We have over 400 of them at InfoWarsLife.com. Over 99% of the respondents would recommend it to a family or friend member. And also we have Silver Bullet. Buy two, get two free. That's 50% off of Silver Bullet. Good time to stock up right now while we have free shipping through this week as a thank you to our supporters. Going back to Lionel, Lionel, what do you make of this? We're seeing this move towards pre-crime in so many different areas and so many different ways. I mean, we've got, uh, we had the NDAA a few years ago where everybody was initially alarmed because they were going to be locking people up with the military without charging anybody of any crime. But now we've got Wesley Clark floating the trial balloons. We've got McCall putting out uh, a, a violent extremism bill where they're going to have uh, FEMA camps, uh, you know, looking, they're going to have the Department of um, we have FEMA under Homeland Security looking at people trying to sort out who may become a problem in the future. Now we see this in Pennsylvania. They're going to be the first state in the country to base criminal sentences not only on what crimes people have been convicted of, but whether they're deemed likely to commit additional crimes. You know, I, I know you don't mean to do this, but your delivery kills me. I was listening to you read a real story and I'm laughing. <laughs> but hey, the government announced whether you're going to lock people up before they've committed the crime. And you're reading this, and I'm laughing. I'm thinking, this isn't this isn't a joke. You know, it's not a in, joke. In, in in 2010, I had talked about this, and I believe uh, Alex did as well. The Brits, because always look to the UK first, always look to Europe first. That's the beta test. That's where they figure these things out. That's the That's right. laboratory. But they had a system called Crush Criminal Criminal Reduction. Of, sorry, Criminal Reduction. Uh, Criminal reduction using statistical um, help or hubris. Using, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So what they did was they they looked at things that were happening uh, based upon weather and crime to predict where crime was likely to be committed. And I think it makes a lot of sense because if you think, well, based upon the statistics, boy, you guys are good. I just say something and lo and behold, there it is. 
when the piece is highlighted, it's amazing, your organization. Anyway, it's one thing to say, this particular area, Precinct 5, has a high burglary rate, and, and New York did it with Comstat and a variety of other things. Okay, that was terrific. Now, that veered into predicting human behavior. Mm-hmm. Now, again, a while back, you may not remember this one, when sex offenders, uh, rapists and the worst of the worst, were given a sentence. Let's say you're given 25 years to life, and a defendant was sentenced and absolutely did every last day of it. And, and you could have post-release, no probation or whatever, but they started to say, you know, there are people who, by virtue of what we've learned and their behavior, might continue to commit rape based upon what they've said, I'm going to rape again or what have you. Let's keep them in jail or in prison. And I thought, wait a minute, hold it. No, 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 no. You can't do that. Either charge them again, wait. I know this is a tough thing. You got to wait until they commit a crime. But people <laughs> say, oh, you don't understand. No, That's no, a novel David, idea. <laughs> this, this, this was real. Is it? You don't understand. The recidivism rate is up. Yes, I understand this. And by the way, you're showing this minority report. Every time I watch a TV show, I can't believe a TV show or movie, I'm watching either the future or I'm using it as a reference. I'm My wife and I watch Mayberry all the time and cry because I'm thinking it really was that way. So yeah. what's happening is, and let me just explain this. When you train an animal, I'm a psych major. I'm, a, I'm an amateur psychologist and a self-appointed TV expert on virtually any subject. But what happens is you do systematic approximation. When you train your dog or your cat or whatever, you give them a little bit and a little bit more, and you acclimate, you habituate, you have this sense where that the stimuli are not novel anymore. So we start off with Crush in 2010. We start off with another story of keeping people in who are rapists. You don't mind that, do you, America? I mean, after all, you don't want somebody raping your daughter. No, that's okay. And then we add a little bit more. And then we go into terrorists. And then we go into bioreferencing. And then... Before you know it, somebody wakes up and says, wait a minute, when did this happen? It happened all along the past couple of years. And when we, the conspiracy theorists, the tinfoil hat lunatics, warned you about this, you didn't listen. You thought this was someplace else. You, in this fog of American exceptionalism, could not believe it's something this draconian could actually take place. Yeah. And it does. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. And we can go back and we can look at how many nonviolent criminals are that are locked up right now in our prisons. And I remember when they started instituting these mandatory minimums under Ronald Reagan, and they were having to let out violent criminals yep. so they could lock up nonviolent pot users. And that was going on for quite some time. They said, don't worry, don't worry, we'll build a lot more prisons. And they did. And now they have prisons where they have contracts with the government, they have a guaranteed occupation rate, they get prison labor that is heavily subsidized, they have every incentive to keep these people in. You're looking at this from a legal standpoint, Lionel, I'm looking at it as a former computer engineer, and I know that when they're going to use a model to determine if somebody's going to remain in prison or whether they're going to send somebody to prison, I'm very frightened by that. I mean, this is all boils down to, well, how good is their model? You know, we got the garbage in, garbage out, everybody talked about with the computer. I'm not impressed when I see a computer printout. I know a lot of people are. If you get a computer to pop up an answer, then that's it. You know, the answer to life is uh, 42, according to Deep Thought or whatever. But I'm not impressed by that because it all depends on your assumptions and your model. How good is your programming? Who gets to make those assumptions? Which corporations are we going to go with? Are we going to go with the ones that grease the palms of the senators the most or the ones that have some kind of a, uh, you know, a program that actually works? But all that skirts, those pragmatic decisions that that are, are really troublesome skirt the whole issue of legality do we want to have the presumption of innocence before we put somebody out should they actually be convicted of a crime i mean this is insane you You know i could i could speak to you forever whenever you say something you inspire a new thought (laughs) we have in this country this crazy idea called probable cause reasonable suspicion and the like and it means simply this if i think if i have and we we had it here in new york i'll stop question and frisk and stop and frisk and terry whatever it is 
let's say you and I are in a car, cop car, late at night, and we say, hey, see that guy over there? Yeah. I think he's up to something. Let's go stop him. Wait a minute. Can't do that. We have no reasonable suspicion. Not probable cause, reasonable suspicion. That's what we do in this country. Police can talk to you. We can arrest you. We can convict you. Hell, we can even kill you. But we have to play by the rules. Well, now we're getting rid of that. Here's what happened a while back. DUI checkpoints. Sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, after all, you, you, you don't want your daughter to be killed. And they always, you know, David, in, uh, in, in trial law, the quickest way to a, to a mistrial is to violate this thing called the golden rule. And it means something like that. How would you feel? How would you feel if this guy broke in here? Ah, and you can almost hear it. Mistrial, because you don't talk about objectifying or translating something into the subjective uh, understanding of the crime. No, it's about proof and weighing the proof, not how you feel. But it started with DUI checkpoints, started with drug testing. Come forward, all you people that we've never suspected. Come here, Mr. Knight, have a seat. Yes, would you please mix your aid into this Dixie cup? Why? Well, to disprove something I've never accused you, nor have I ever, ever thought you ever violated. You've never been to work late or stoned or whatever. By the way, all of you in this lane, pull over to disprove that you're not drunk, even though there are no indicia, indications, evidence that you are. It also started with, and today, you can forget it, immigration checkpoints. Everybody just be corralled. So little by little, again, more acclimation, more conditioning, more habituation, more getting used to this idea, and more of an acceptance that probable cause, reasonable suspicion, all of these precursors don't really apply anymore. We're going to cut out the middleman. So that's what we're doing also in this scheme of things. And, you know, it's one thing when you are a public carrier, you're a bus driver. And by the way, I've I've got to say this about uh, drug testing. I never understood something, which is normally a urine test, that detects whether I've come into contact with something 30 days ago, Mm -hmm. two weeks ago. Hell, if you're going to do a test of a guy driving a bus, do a blood test. I mean, if you're going to have to. So we, we have completely eliminated the idea of the police ever having problem with cause. By the way, you ever seen this? They pick up the phone. Mr. Knight, yeah. Listen, this is uh, uh, Detective Gil Hooley. We want you to come down to the station. All right, I'll be there. And people do. Come down <laughs> to the station for what? What is this, an invitation? You're going to buy me lunch? I don't have to do anything you say. Here's one for you. You most probably, and I'm not versed with Texas law, but where I'm from, you can lie all you want to a police officer. What's your name, son? Donald Duck. Where are you from? Oz. Well, that's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's the breaks. You lie to an FBI agent, and that's what happened to Martha Stewart. Oops, pardon me. That's what happened to Martha Stewart. So why, why, why can't I lie? I have the right to remain silent. I'm not under oath. And, and, oh, here we go, drug dogs. This is a better one. How many people just believe in drug dogs? They just say, <laughs> they just, I mean, don't you? I do. I mean, what are we going to have next? Clairvoyance and psychics? No, we do that every now and then. So wh- wh- what's and, happening? And, of course, Lionel, the drug dogs don't even talk. And so the the officer is free to interpret any activity of the dog as a positive sign if he so wishes. If the dog wags his tail, then, oh, he finds something in your car that's suspicious. So now let's go in and take a look at it. It's, it's just amazing to, as you're pointing out, the lack of the presumption of even innocence. I mean, it started out really used to be that it was only the IRS where you had to prove that you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that that you are innocent of of doing any of this stuff. Then we move to the to the drug situation. Now we're moving to the war on terror. And it just everybody has been conditioned progressively to accept the fact that we don't have any presumption of innocence anymore. It's absolutely amazing. But that's how they move the Overton window. Well, you know, let, let, let me ask you this. You know, when I was a um, prosecutor, the, the, the case well, what I learned right away was, you know, when you put somebody in prison, you know, jail's bad enough. Don't forget, prison is over a year or over. Jail is up to a year. But when you put somebody in prison, you better, you better hope to God 
they don't come out worse, which they often do. But here's what I would say. 90%, if I were a judge and I did not have mandatory minimums or sentencing guidelines or three strikes are out, habitual felony offenders and all those weird statutes, nine out of 10 people, with the exception of really serious stuff, I put them on probation. Probation is really effective. Probation is a pain in the arse, as some would say, and it allows you to maintain going to work, you know, maintaining for your family. A lot of times it really, the amount of recidivism, probation works like a charm, but it's considered to be weak in this country. Now, the people I do, if I were the judge, I take you off the, of the street, not as a punishment, you know, penal, poena from Latin punishment, not that. I take you off the street to protect society. Mm -hmm. You are, you cannot comport. It doesn't teach you. You know, in the old days, David, there was the idea of the penitentiary. Penance. You were penitent. We was the reform school. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the penitentiary. We wanted to teach you something, pay your debt to society. You know, the idea is that you would come, go in and come out better. That is ridiculous. When the sentencing guidelines came along in the 70s or 80s, the first thing they wrote in many of the state statutes was, it is not rehabilitation, is the, that is not our goal. It's punishment. Punishment for what you've done. And what happens is you take people, and after you let them out, they can't get a job, can't get credit, they can't do anything. You've destroyed them. Yes. And some do very, very well. So what you're doing is you're creating this new class of citizens. Now, we're also getting into this, which is even more frightening. David, you and I talk about this all the time. And I don't want to sound like some old geezer on the front porch when I was a boy. But there was a time when I remember looking at the police officer as being my friend. Norman Rockwell, call it what you want. The guy in your neighborhood. Did you ever have somebody who parked their patrol car down the street? Hey, that's Jimmy Thompson's dad. He's the guy on Sunday who directs traffic after church. It was a community thing. The cop wasn't, there we go. The cop was, look at this, this poor kid, look at this picture. He's running away. He's got the knapsack. And what is this cop doing? He looks like Chris Christie, the cop, if you look at him. <laughs> He's looking at the kid and he's saying, basically, he's talking him over. Now, you might be a little bit suspicious. I hope they called the parent and told him, little Jimmy's okay. But this was the idea. Today, and he would taser him and put him in handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> he would be drugged up. He'd be on some kind of psychiatric medication in some juvenile home. So, and, and to, to show you how old I guess I am, remember, remember, I'm so sorry. Remember in years ago, there was a show SWAT. SWAT, Special Weapons and Tactics, ABC, when it just became new, we didn't know what a SWAT team was. And all of a sudden, these guys, whatever they would get, Greg Forrest was his name or something, whenever they would have to go to some event, they changed out of their uniform, put on their SWAT military stuff with just a black cap, maybe an automatic weapon, and then changed back. That ain't the way it is. They're oh, yeah. rolling. 24 7. That's right. Now we have incarceration by algorithm. That's going to be the next thing. Not only the not, not the presumption of innocence, but incarceration by algorithm. We got one more segment with Lionel, Lionel Media, and I want to talk when we come back about the presidential race and get your take on that as a news decoder. We'll be right back with Lionel. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm David Knight, and we're talking to Lionel of Lionel Media, an Emmy Award winning television news decoder. Legal analysts, we've been talking about pre-crime. We've been talking about training our children to live in a prison society. That's what I think that they've turned the schools into. This segment, I want to talk to Lionel about his take on the political race, particularly Donald Trump, because as it's pointed out in the LA Times, Trump is a candidate everyone can name, and everyone has a name for him. There's a lot of different reactions on this. Of course, if we looked at the debate that was on... In, in New Hampshire on uh, Monday night, that was the typical kind of snooze fest that we've become accustomed to. It's going to be far more interesting on Thursday night because Donald Trump is going to be there. And I think it's going to be an interesting debate. It remains to be seen if we're going to have anything of any substance. But I think it'll be 
Very entertaining, Lionel. What do you think? Well, you know, years ago, um, you might have remembered this. One of my favorite shows on television was SCTV, Second City Television. And there was a character named Vic Hedges who ran for mayor, and his motto was, Vic Hedges, sure he's crazy, but what if he's right? Well, that's <laughs> Donald Trump. What if he's right? I, by the way, every, and this is, this is a God's honest truth, every um, presidential election race, I write in my own name on the ballot. I'm not voting for any of these people. That being said, Donald Trump is fascinating because he's telling the mainstream media, you're not going to determine who's the candidate. You're not going to determine who makes sense, who's smart, who's viable. The people do. And the people, like it or not, I will always err on the side of the popular vote, say we like him. And by the way, he has, he, Bernie Sanders, and Rand Paul, by the way, have some of the most cogent and comprehensive views on how to handle uh, Putin, Russia, and Ukraine, which is a Cold War about to go hot. So in many respects, Donald Trump is my new hero because the professional left mainstream media, the John Stewart's and others, can't believe that their dislike means nothing. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen... Some things that he's had to say that I agree with and in print, uh, he hasn't really articulated a lot of these yet. We, he might be doing that uh, in the debates as we see this come up. I guess one of my questions, Lionel, about Donald Trump is he's, he's kind of like Picasso. You know, Picasso had a blue period yeah. uh, followed by a rose period. Right. And the same thing with Donald Trump. You know, He had a period where he gave a lot more money to the Democrats. He had his blue period. And then he went into a rose period, a red period about five years oh. ago, where he stepped up his contributions and gave almost exclusively to Republicans. So when you go back and you look at PolitiFact, they say, well, that's not true. He's given more money to Republicans than he did to Democrats. That is if you average it over 26 years. Oh. But in the last, and that's mainly because the last five years, he's really stepped it up. Uh, David, I got to ask this question. Who the hell is PolitiFact? Yeah. Who smokes? Who are these people? They say, I'm a fat. Okay, well, listen, prediction quickly. Hillary's going to drop out. She ain't going to be there. She's not going to be there. I don't know if it's going to be health, uh, uh, emails. She's not going to be there. Once they get the green light, Joe Biden is coming to the fore now because he's already meeting with big Democratic fundraisers, big donors. You've got to get rid of Hillary first. She's gone. I think Why? so. Also, uh, Bernie Sanders is a is the catch basin, the little wheel for the Democratic Party. He's forcing him to go left. And also Elizabeth Warren, who said, I am not going to run. I am not going to run with Hillary out of the picture. Watch what she has to say. So that's not. But, but Hillary is toast. Absolute. Take this to the bank. I've been saying this forever. It ain't going to happen. And by the way. Uh, well, there we are. I agree. I think that uh, there's plenty of people in the Democrat Party. It's not just Republicans who want to lock her up. They want to lock her out, and they will use all these scandals. I mean, she's got a lot of stuff on her plate. Uh, we've been talking to Lionel from Lionel Media. You can find him on Twitter at, at Lionel Media. Thank you so much for joining us. Join us tonight at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern for the